uh, technology to be used in place of a meeting. So you are all experiencing history and our board office has done a fantastic job in helping to do that. No matter how many emails you may have had, no matter how many cancellations you have, in fact that we're on the phone now, uh, we're exercising history. So I want to thank everyone for that and for their participation within the office. Um, Rob, are you on the line? My parents. I'm, I'm here. You, you, you want me to do the roll call? Yes, you. Yes, I would. Uh, Tony Singletary. Here. Leonard Jordan. Here. Barbara Zeller Greener. Jessica Thurston. Here. Juliet Cohen Chung. Here. Carlton Gordon. Carlton, I saw you. Yeah, uh, calls us on me. Illinois. Here. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Smith. Good evening, everyone. Carol Gelbs. Here. Irene Janner. Here. Glad you made it. Andrew Lastowecki. Nah, it's the um, Denise Peterson. Community board meeting. Here. Dorothea Thompson Manning. Uh, you have six voting members, Mr. Singletary, and I would like to remind everyone on the line that uh, the meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Rob. So we have six voting members. A couple of things I want to mention again. One, um, to reiterate, the meeting is being recorded. Number two, if you're not speaking, go on mute. Number three, if you are someone who has the ability to log in through the computer and you're logging in through your phone, pick one. Can't do both. It'll come back with an echo. So from a technology perspective, pick one, don't, don't log into both. And again, um, I can't repeat enough, please try not to um, have your phone on mute. So thank, now that we've addressed agenda item number one, um, roll call, um, by way of roll call, we've been, we have the introduction of the committee officers. I'm not gonna have every person introduce who they are. Um, may I have an approval of tonight's agenda? So moved. So moved by Mr. Smith. Can I get a second? Second, Juliet. Second by Ms. Juliet Cullen Chong. Are there any, is there any edits or any discussion on the motion? I don't think I need any, but we're doing this through tech, the phone. So I want to make sure we're clear as my colleague Jessica is taking minutes and this is being recorded. Hearing none, um, tonight's agenda is approved. Agenda item number three, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes of February 25th, exec committee meeting? Is that a yes or do I need more time? Talk to me, people. You're fine. Yes. Okay, great. Can I, um, so everyone has a chance to review those minutes. This is great. Um, are there any noted corrections or any comments? This is Juliet. I gave some comments to uh, Rob and Jessica, and they were going to incorporate. Okay, great. Thank you, Juliet. Anyone else with any um, edits? Oh. Hearing none, um, the minutes from the meeting of February 25th has been accepted. Moving on to agenda item number four, the acceptance of the minutes from March 11th, 2020, general meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review those minutes? Yes. Great. Any are there any noted corrections or comments? Yes, I I have some uh, corrections. Uh, Barbara, I need you to speak up a little bit. I can't hear you too well. All right, let me make this louder. Uh, page uh, page one, number two. Mayor's representative. His name is listed. Hey, Barbara. I it's Jessica. I really can't hear you well. Do you think you yeah. could? Put them in, um, 
over email to me and Rob? Sure. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, Barbara, we can see your mouth moving, but we can't hear you, so just FYI. Okay. Anybody else with any um, edits? Okay, great. Hearing none, the minutes from um, the March 11th meeting, which, by the way, was the last time we saw each other in person. It's been a long time. Um, have been accepted. Item number five on the agenda. Construction fence artwork um, plus um, street seats activation for Temple Square. We have some representatives here um, from, uh, I think, Rob, correct me. Is, do we do we have a sense that all these individuals who are listed under item number five are on the call? Um, I saw um, Emily on the call. Emily, can you hear me? Um, I see Nina Marin on the call. Okay. You have David McCarty on the call. And Jessica Kronstein from um, from DOT. Uh, okay, so so there's a lot of individuals listed here on the call. Who am I going to look to? To is there a committee report? Is there one of the chairs or, or co-chairs that are going to lead this, or should I have one of the individuals here be a spokesperson? Uh, Mr. Singletary, the an earlier version of the presentation was emailed to the transportation committee when we did not know that we were going to uh, be meeting uh, by teleconference tonight. Right. Um, but um, I believe that Alloy and uh, their designer, Tyler Ken, are prepared to um, share their screen and present um, the design proposal along with a team from DOT. David, do okay. you want to take the lead? So yeah, I'm, happy do that, too. I'm, I'm sorry, before you do that, Juliet, is, is there anything that you want to say before we turn it over to the team? Uh, no, I have uh, comments and I'm happy to uh, ask the questions after the presentation. Okay, great. So, sorry about that interruption. The floor is yours. We'll listen to your presentation. Great. I'm going to try to share my screen. Tell me when you can see the rainbow colored PDF pop up. You can see the rainbow colored PDF. That's really cool. Thank you. Great. So my name is David McCarty. I am the vice president at Alloy Developments. There are several people um, on the agenda for the presentation today because this is really a collective proposal between Alloy Development, DOT, uh, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, and in collaboration with Tyler Ken, who is the designer. Um, I think most of you know where Temple Square is, but for those who don't, it is a small public space. You, if you can see my cursor, it's technically this um, area of land. It's at the corner of Flatbush Avenue, Third Avenue, and Skimmerhorn Street. And it's been identified for a long time as a underutilized public space. It's also adjacent to the 80 Flatbush development, which we are the developers on. And we've been working with the Downtown Book and Partnership and DOT um, over the last several months to try to achieve um, really two goals. One is the activation, temporary activation and improvement of that public space. And two, as we get into construction of 80 Flatbush, um, a public art piece along the, the construction fence which is uh, you know, typically the Hunter Green spec from DOB. Um, before we get too much deeper into the presentation, I'll turn it over to um, DOT to talk through their Street Seeds program and public art program. Hi, uh, this is Jessica Kronstein. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, so you guys are all pretty familiar with the Street Seat program. It's an application-based program where we turn underutilized roadway into public space. Um, we have five, give or take, street seats in your district. 
Um, it's important to note that right now we're looking at transitioning our street seat program from the platform model, which you're more familiar with. So that would be like the ones at Burn Street and Duffield Street to a non-platform street seat. So that's closer to the brick street seat that is also in your district. So that combines, so that is, um, it's all of our standard materials. It's uh, not a platform and it combines public seating with um, biking. Um, and so, you know, as with all of the rest of our street seats that you are familiar with, um, the maintenance partner here would be Downtown Brooklyn Partnership and they would take on the daily maintenance, um, but it would be just like all of the others, public space. It is open to the public at all times. We, um, the furniture gets put away at night, it's movable. Um, and yeah. Uh, we provide technical support and um, design review and inspections. And I'll hand it over to Nina now to talk through the art program. Cool. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Great. Um, so I'm Nina Marin, a program manager for the DOT's temporary art program. Um, and through the program, we partner with community-based organizations and artists to realize temporary artwork um, on our property, which includes sidewalks, plazas, median, bridges, et cetera. Um, we're working often with our internal operating units at DOT, in this case, public space, to realize the project. Um, and some of our goals when we're activating um, our property with temporary artwork is to create a more attractive corridor, increase access to art in the public realm. Um, and through this process, we work with a variety of artists um, and all of our projects that we present on our property is temporary. Um, you may be familiar, you may have seen some throughout the city, we're in all five boroughs. Um, this particular project is presented through our art interventions track um, where an organization and artist team applies directly to our program um, with a specific location in mind. Um, our advisory committee then reviews that application and DOT Art works with the project team throughout implementation um, leading up to, during, and we work on coordinating all logistical elements as well as permitting with all appropriate uh, team members. Yep, so that's about it for, for me for now. <laughs> Great. Um, the other city program that is um, instrumental in making this proposal um, happen is through the Department of Cultural Affairs, and it's a program done in partnership with ArtBridge called City Canvas. And um, it is essentially taking scaffolding and other typical DOT construction fencing that would normally be the hunter green spec that's required by. Um, DOB and creating public artwork uh, for it. So our proposal, in addition to applying for um, approval through the Department of Transportation, both the street seats and the art program, is also an application through the Department of Cultural Affairs City Canvas program. Uh, we talked about the specific location of the site. Temple Square is this triangular public space, it's technically DOT land. Um, it has a, if you are familiar with it today, it has a few trees, no seating. Um, it has uh, been underutilized and um, not well maintained for a long period of time. And so it's a, something that's been on our radar, on DOT's radar and downtown Brooklyn Partnership's radar as a potential, um, you know, vibrant public space with some additional resources. In addition, the first phase of the 80 Flatbush project is essentially everything to the east of the current Khalil Gibran Academy. And you can see that that um, section would be wrapped in the standard construction fence and along Flatbush Avenue would have overhead protection. We um, typically at Alloy, we like uh, engaging in um, 
public artwork and community engagement type um, activities. You may remember we had a, we still had buildings on the 85 Bush site. We commissioned a local Brooklyn artist, Katie Mertz, to do a big black and white mural on two of the buildings that we owned. Uh, we also worked with DOT for a one day plaza closure um, that happened back in 2016. We came to the community board prior to that one day closure. Um, and that was done in collaboration with several of the cultural institutions in downtown Brooklyn. We did a fall cultural kickoff where we had, uh, I think it was, you know, a dozen or so cultural organizations do performances and advertise their fall calendar right at this Temple Square location. So as we moved into construction, uh, we were interested in continuing um, to invest in this place help the public start seeing this as a public space that could be used for gathering and performance, and to also do something above and beyond and, and better than your typical DOT, uh, DOB construction fence. So we um, issued an RFP to a bunch of small design and architecture firms um, with a focus primarily on MWBE and local um, architecture, design, and artists. And through that RFP, which we did in collaboration with Downtown Book and Partnership, um, Tyler Ken, which is a design firm that is based um, in Brooklyn and in Latin America, was the winning respondent. And I believe Greg is on the line. Um, and I'll yes. introduce him in a second, and he can talk you through his proposal. But maybe before we do, um, I know Ryan, Ryan Grew, are you on from Downtown Brooklyn Partnership? He might not be, but uh, I think Ryan has presented to you, or can, he's certainly presented to the Transportation Committee often, I assume you've met him. Uh, he manages all of the plazas in Downtown Brooklyn for the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, and they are um, a very essential partner in this both from uh, the selection process of the RFP, but also to ongoing maintenance and operation. Hi, Belinda. Hi, David, sorry, Ryan, I'm texting Ryan. He's having some sort of technical issues. So no I'll, just, I'll just back you up on everything you just said. We're really excited <laughs> about this. Yeah, so listen, this is Lenny Singletary. We don't need Ryan. Tell him, relax, <laughs> tell him enjoy his evening. Whatever we need to get back up, we will. And Belinda, I'm sure you can be a capable representative. So with that, please continue. Yep. Thank you, Lenny. So with that, I will pass it over to Greg, one of the founding partners of Tyler Kin, to walk, give you a little background on what they do and to talk you through the design. Uh, hi, everyone. Do you hear me OK? Yes. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Gregory Melitonov, and um, as David mentioned, uh, I run a small architecture and design practice that's um, based both in New York City and um, in Central America. And uh, working um, down south, we really are always in kind of um, the context of a developing economy. And because of the sort of different social tiers that we run into, uh, our works also kind of over time developed um, an engagement with uh, creating large scale public works um, that really aim to bring in um, a, a broader community than um, is usually typical and working, uh, working with um, local craftsmen and a lot of community members um, are, has sort of created a feedback loop with our work where uh, we've sort of developed a kind of style um with our um firm's work both in the large-scale public um interventions that we've done that are more temporary and more um kind of uh let's say art artworks uh and if uh, david you could go to the next slide um also has kind of an, it um touches sort of every aspect of the projects we do um kind of making sure that we uh infuse the work that we do with a lot of um of color texture and uh sort of an overall playfulness that really helps us to create a bigger tent and appeal um to 
uh, a lot of people beyond um, kind of the usual consumer of design. So um, when we were approached for the RFP process, uh, we sort of saw the, the um, design problem as addressing uh, sort of the, the two sides of the project, as David mentioned. One is the um, large amount of street shed uh, that would be kind of like the ubiquitous New York scaffolding that was going to be uh, almost, you know, a full city block uh, length along Flatbush Avenue, and then also the Temple Square uh, open plaza um, on Lafayette. And uh, we really wanted to find a language that worked for both of these things and, and actually connected them as kind of um, one larger piece um, while still maintaining that kind of um, lightness and playfulness and accessibility, uh, sort of creating a big piece of public art that could be enjoyed by everyone. Uh, next, please. So um, the, uh, the approach to designing the street shed was really to work within the confines of, of typical New York scaffolding and just um, and just kind of elevate it, um, nothing too fancy, but uh, adding just a, a very limited palette of colors, um, which uh, would kind of uh, create a large scale art installation that could be appreciated from um, different uh, speeds of experience because you have a, uh, a lot of traffic along Flatbush and a lot of pedestrian traffic as well. So we wanted something that could kind of be um, appreciated on the intimate scale of a person walking uh, through the scaffolding, of somebody walking across from the scaffolding, or of um, of a uh, automobile passing in either direction of the traffic. So essentially, it's it's your typical New York scaffolding, just given a kind of um, uh, a color blocking treatment with an addition of um, a row of colored lighting, uh, which um, at night would create um, enhance the visibility and uh, and increase the safety of the of the scaffolding corridor as well. And then uh, on the plaza side, um, we wanted to take a, a similar approach, but really um, you treat the street shed almost like a backdrop uh, and connect it with the plaza in order to create a real sense of space. Because as David mentioned, right now the plaza itself is quite small and doesn't really um, lend itself to any impromptu activity that one usually finds uh, in, a, in a public park. Um, but the, the idea to kind of knit the, um, the background of the street shed with, the, um, with, a, with a design that, that kind of um, turns down onto the plaza paving creates a, a real sense of space, even though the, the uh, plaza is still completely open. Um, and then, uh, just going forward, we also, uh, in line with the street seat conversation, we looked for ways to kind of enlarge um, the, what is now sidewalk paving and um, kind of grow the pedestrian area into the traffic space uh, to really uh, enhance the visual presence and also the usability of the space uh, and uh, layered in a, um, DOT approved planters and loose seating that's um, very already familiar to the kind of average New York pedestrian. So they, again, there's no barrier for access. This is designed sort of for everybody. And that just by seeing those kind of typical um, public uh, tables and chairs, people will know that it's okay to sit there. It's okay to kind of enjoy this space. And hopefully that uh, starts to develop kind of a, um, uh, a user base, let's say, um, which could be, um, uh, the space could kind of host um, impromptu events or planned um, planned events with the uh, large amount of cultural institutions in the area. Which uh, oh, and also uh, we were uh, after the RFP process, we were asked to kind of extend uh, the treatment of the design onto State Street, and this seemed like a really um, good opportunity to tie um, the the design. Uh, to the other side of the block, so it didn't feel like a, a backside as much, but also uh, kind of just work with the existing street shed that was there to to kind of make a quiet, uh, a quieter intervention. And um, oh, 
Yeah, I can take this. In terms of community outreach, um, we at Alloy, along with Downtown Brooklyn Partnership and Greg, have um, made a very um, concerted effort to uh, develop this proposal in collaboration with a bunch of key stakeholders. For our 80 Flatbush project, we have a community advisory group that meets every two months. On that advisory group, um, Cheryl from the community board is on it. Um, in addition, there's representatives from the local block association, um, one Hanson Place condo board, 300 Ashland Rental Building, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, Downtown Brooklyn Arts Alliance, uh, the Rockwell Bears Garden, a bunch of folks. And they've been kept uh, in the loop as the proposal's been developed. Greg came and presented uh, the proposal to them back in this late summer, I want to say. Um, and in addition to that, because there are aspirations that from time to time, the Temple Square Plaza could be activated with cultural programming, um, Greg has done a bunch of additional outreach to um, one-off cultural organizations in the district. You know, aside from the Downtown Brooklyn Arts Alliance, who sits on the community advisory group, um, he's met with Mark Morris, folks at Brick, folks at Colette, Ada, Recess, and a bunch of others. In terms of timeline, this slide that you see on your screen was the timeline before um, the COVID crisis really began. And that timeline was for us to officially apply for the street seats application process, present to you the community board, and then really start implementation this spring so that it could be open for the nice weather. Um, as you are well aware, there is a construction moratorium in the city and the COVID crisis continues. So um, this timeline is no longer accurate. I wish I could give you an accurate timeline, um, but I can't. I think the intention is as soon as it is safe um, and feasible to do the installation work, uh, we would like to do it so that we can um, hopefully hit at least some of the nice weather this spring and summer. And that's it. I'm happy to take any questions if people might. All right, so we'll we'll do we'll do this in a somewhat. You know, I'm not even going to say somewhat. I'm confident in my colleagues. We're going to do this in an orderly fashion because we're going to have questions only from committee board members, right? Committee board members, not community board members, but committee board members. So let me start with Juliet Cullen Chung, who is the chair of the Transportation and Public Safety Committee. So, Juliet, I'll turn it to you if you have any questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, you did address one of my questions in the uh, presentation about the um, the maintenance of the plaza and the furniture. Um, it was mentioned that the furniture would be taken in at night. And um, I was, I'm just going to give uh, all of my questions at once so everybody can respond. Um, I, I would like to know what time at night the furniture is going to be taken in. And if it's very late, if there's going to be any security, maybe as part of the construction project that might um, also walk by the plaza at nighttime. Um, and then also just thinking about coronavirus, um, whether there's going to be any wiping down of the seats um, on a daily basis before the furniture is put away. So one of my questions was about the furniture. Um, the other one, uh, maintenance wise, um, I was wondering how long the plaza is expected to last, how many years, um, and if there's any idea of refreshing the paint um, at any point, if need be, during that, um, during that uh, period. Um, in, I, I have noted, uh, noticed some, like there was another plaza in Williamsburg, for example, where the paint became worn after a year, the, um, the, um, the paint on the pavement. Um, the other, um, note was, um, that I noticed there were three trees in the plan, um, but Google Street View shows four trees currently. So I'm wondering if there's a, a street tree being eliminated from the plaza. Um, and then overall, I think it's great that uh, you guys are bringing this uh, this vibrancy and the color to the neighborhood um, with the with the painting and with the with the lights. I think it'll be I think it'll be a really nice addition. Great. Well, I can try to answer the questions. Um, Ryan is probably going to be the most helpful as it relates to the street furniture, but. Um, 
the street furniture will be purchased by Alloy. It will be standard DOT um, bistro chairs and tables that you see at other public spaces in downtown Brooklyn. Um, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership will manage um, putting up and taking down the furniture every night in the same way that they do over at the 300 Ashland Plaza and several of the other plazas in downtown Brooklyn. And Dave, I'm not aware of the timing. Belinda, do you know when yeah, those get yes, set up and taken down? Yep, yep, yep. It'll just be it'll be in line with the other plazas, which is according to the DOE fund schedule, uh, which is generally um, around 7 p.m. And as to all the as to the uh, sanitation questions, um, they will be following a really strict protocol of sanitizing all the furniture. And that wouldn't be at the end of the day merely; it would be throughout the day. Thank you. In terms of the length of duration, um, the construction of the phase one of 80 Flatbush is roughly a three year construction process. Um, and this is being permitted through DOT on a one year basis. The intention is that we have um, part of why we liked Greg's design approach is that it is very easy to maintain versus a more elaborate mural. And so the intention is that whatever, um, and I think it's six or seven discrete colors, that instead of, as you would typically have at a job site, you would have a big bucket of hunter green paint that you would use to cover up graffiti. We will just have six or seven of them that are the different colors. And, um, you know, construction fences get marked up often in the city and need to be uh, touched up on a regular basis, um, depending on how much graffiti there is. So the intention is that it is an ongoing refresh um, and that the at the end of the calendar year, whenever this is, is approved just for the year, there would be the potential for um, us to reevaluate the current design. And you could imagine a, a, a lot of different ways that Greg and his team could um, could elaborate on it and make it a different and, and better thing over time. Uh, we also think that, you know, it's helpful, but you can see actually here in this rendering the Katie Mertz mural that we had on the two buildings for several years. And it was very well received in the community, but after us, you know, I forget if it was 12 or 18 months, we started getting feedback that was like, okay, we've seen that. Like, wouldn't it be nice if we could, you know, modify it? So I think that's um, another thing that we like about the, the proposal. Um, in terms of street trees, there are four street trees. One of them is dead. Um, you can actually see it in this uh, rendering. It's the one that covers up most of the brick building of 362 Skimmerhorn Street. And we have put in a request to Department of Parks um, to let them know that it is dead and there is a long waiting list. My, my understanding is there is a long waiting list for removal. Um, so I don't know what the status of that is. Would it eventually be replaced? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it's a question for parks. It could, we, we love street trees, so we'd be happy to replace it. There's, it's currently okay. dead and so we're waiting for crews to Get around to actually removing it. Thank you. So let me now go to Cheryl Gelbs as our representative on the advisory committee for 80 Flatbush. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, I really okay. like this design, but this one thing I, I just heard that he might change it every year so that it is not like after a while, people get sick of seeing the same thing, <laughs> maybe every year. Refresh it, it would be nice, but it's a beautiful concept. you like it. Great, thank you for that statement. So now I'm gonna open it up to other committee members. Are there any questions? Hi, this is Lenny, Lenny Jordan. Uh, just one question about the uh, the uh, furniture now. Would, would the furniture? Where would the furniture be stored? Would there be a another little building like erected uh, to put the furniture in, or how does that work? Um, hello. hello. Yes. <laughs> Generally speaking, um, and I'm not sure if we have access to any inner 
uh, interior storage space. But generally, we um, chain them up at the end of the night. Okay, so it would be on the site just chained up? Most likely. Uh -huh. Thanks, Belinda. No worries. That's all. Thank you. I, th I think it's a very good idea. Thank you very much. Anyone else with any questions? Um, I just have one question. Um, sorry, I'm this sorry, is could you introduce it? Yeah, there you go. This is Brandon Smith. Um, I was just wondering, uh, and first of all, I, I also like the design. I have no concerns about that. I was just wondering about snow removal in the winter time on particularly like the, the the plaza area and that walkway that seems to be in between the scaffolding and the and the plaza. Who would be responsible for that? And yeah, that, that's really my only concern. Um, um, this is within the boundaries of um, downtown Brooklyn Partnerships Bailiwick. So for supplemental, <coughs> excuse me, snow removal, we would be responsible. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions from committee members? Yeah, it, well, oh, we're still just on the transportation committee. No, that's why I said anybody. So go ahead, Barbara, you can ask the question. All right, hopefully you can hear me now. We turned on the microphone. Um, I can hear you better. Okay. I'm, I'm going to move closer to the microphone. Ah, uh, there you go, Barbara. Okay. Way, you, way to go. There you go. Uh, I, I think this project is lovely. Um, and when, when you got up close, the colors looked much more inviting. If the underlying purpose of this was to get me to change my view of 80 Flatbush. It doesn't do that. But I particularly like the lights under the scaffolding. There has been outreach to us saying that um, gave this proposal to the community advisory group. It didn't include State Street, and there was a member of the 500 block of State Street who felt left out and requested that the design be brought down their block. So um, there has been a conflicting feedback, and uh, Greg has tried to. Uh, Accommodated as best as could. On the question of the current COVID crisis and its um, relationship to construction in general, and at 80 Flatbush more specifically, um, the construction moratorium is in place. We, as such, are not 
planning on the intention was to start construction on the first phase of 80 Flatbush sometime this spring. That was prior to the COVID crisis happening. The construction moratorium is in place currently, so um, the exact start of construction is still TBD, but the by all means we are moving ahead with the project. And and how long will the art installation and street seats be installed? The street seats uh, application is a one-year application um, that can be renewed, but the, the original approval is for just the first year. Um, and the construction fence, um, you know, construction of the first phase is roughly a three-year duration. And so we would expect the construction fence to be up for those three years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we imagine there would be a refresh of the design, um, you know, at, at an, an annual basis. And Mr. Singletary, I uh, just received one additional uh, question and comment uh, via email. Uh, Zach Martin, who is the pastor of youth and outreach at um, the church that's in the Baptist temple, um, he states that no outreach has been done to include um, the congregation at the Recovery House of Worship. And he states, I was curious if the other side of the street and the sidewalk will be addressed. There are too many planters in this area in general, making it very difficult to maneuver. Can we address the issue of hundreds of new pedestrians being introduced to the area and planters and an art installation and city bikes already being there? That's the point. Um, Rob, if you wouldn't mind giving him my contact information. We've tried to reach out to the church in the past and haven't um, been able to connect. So I'd be happy to um, reach out to them and give the same presentation. We would also uh, love to have them on our advisory committee and have tried to do that in the past and haven't been successful. So if you wouldn't mind the introduction, that would be really helpful. I'd be happy to do both of those things. Thank you. Any other questions on committee members? Great, thank you for the presentation. Um, good luck with the rest of the project and please make sure you reach out to the church. Um, and I thank you for offering up your contact information. I really appreciate that, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Singletary, uh, um, I just wanted to suggest since I see some people um, on the participant panel who did not, uh, I see committee members who are on the participant panel who did not answer the roll call. When you do get ready for a vote, I'd like to do a roll call vote if that's possible. Yeah, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Are we there now for this? Rob, does this require a roll call vote? Um, yeah, it also requires a motion before a roll call vote. No, no, I got you. I just wanted to make okay. sure that I wasn't skipping anything. <laughs> All right. No, I was Perfect. just trying to, you know, tickle some of your um, fellow committee members. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. So with that, um, and hearing no more questions, because I've asked several times, we're going to move in. I'll entertain a motion to um, to accept the commit, to actually to accept the, rec accept the recommendation for the Temple Square design. Uh, so moved, uh, Mr. Singletary, Mr. Uh, Lynn Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Can I get a second? Second from Juliet. Thank you, for, thank you, Juliet. Second by Juliet. Is there any discussion on the motion? Can I ask? Um, can I ask Cheryl what she thought of the State Street side uh, being part of the Community Advisory Committee? At the meeting, so State Street, as David was saying, you get you get conflicting uh, issues. Some people would say they love everything, and then the next meeting they'll come back and say they don't like it. And it seems like they have to get together and have one voice: you like it or you don't. You know, it depends on who is speaking to who on State Street. to get conflicting responses. But I think when I saw this, when I saw this presentation, I thought that was the best thing because I hate to see that ugly green 
spread out through that entire. That, that is such a big piece of, you know, uh, eyesore of all green. And by, by the time they finish sticking up all these different posters, you know what happens in the construction site. It'll be, it'll be ugly. So what they propose is beautiful if they can maintain it. And State Street, it's a yes for some, it's a no for some, but you have to look at the entire uh, Brooklyn community. Would, you know, we want something that would appeal to everybody. Thanks. So thank you, Cheryl. Julia, anything else? No. Wow. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, let me just add that this is being recorded and green or colors, what's beautiful and not is in the eye of the beholder. So while uh, Cheryl was able to uh, express her sincere feelings that may not reflect the opinions of all of the community board or the community as a whole, but we respect her position and thank her for her work on the advisory committee. So hearing no further discussion, all in favor, oh no, I'm sorry, Rob, you can do your roll call. Uh, Mr. Singletary. Yes. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Zeller-Gringer. Barbara. Yes. Uh, Jessica Thurston. Yes. Juliet Cohen-Chung. Yes. Carlton, are you with us? All right, Rob, um, thank you for that. So the next item on the agenda, item six, Landmarks and Preservation Commission Certificate of Appropriateness application. I, I really need uh, Carlton or Irene to get off mute. This, this, is, this is where I need you to step up as chair. So is it possible you can click the button that takes you off mute? I hit. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Good job, Carlton. All right, you're All right. Okay, can you hear? Okay. Yes. yes. You can hear me now. We can. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Okay, so I guess we'll start with the Brooklyn Bridge one, uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, I don't have the agenda in front of me, but I know it's a redo of uh, some of the work around the tower and uh, some of the work, around, you know, doing some brick work along and opening up some area in a grassy area. So, so Carlton, let me help you out. I'm gonna read what's on the agenda. Brooklyn Bridge Park, normally 11 Water Street, Fulton Ferry Historic District. Application is to construct a public plaza beneath the Brooklyn Bridge and beyond using a Playotech precast paver and asphalt, asphalt, and to enlarge the existing Empire Stores Fulton Ferry lawn and create a new lawn area and fenced paid, planting beds with security ballots, benches, and other seating. And Mr. Chairman, I see that uh, Eric Landau, the president of uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, is uh, on on the uh, on the call, and he is joined by Lindsey Ross from his staff, and I believe they are prepared to make a presentation. So, Eric, I see you waving. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm doing okay. Okay, great. 
So um, if you're ready to make a presentation, we're ready to listen. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and um, before I actually start my presentation on the Plaza Project, I actually want to thank the community board for helping get some of our messaging out over the last six, seven weeks. Um, you know, obviously we are living in very interesting times um, and uh, there are changes to the park in terms of what is currently open and what protocols we are asking people to comply with in terms of social distancing, certain areas of the park that are closed where social distancing is practical and the community board has been really fantastic in helping to push out some of that messaging. So I, I really appreciate, I, I really appreciate that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, to your leadership and Rob Harris uh, for your, your uh, diligence as well. Um, ha having said that, um, the, the Brooklyn Bridge Plaza project uh, uh, is being presented to the executive committee tonight. Uh, it's actually being presented to the community board now, for, really for the first time in this design. We were scheduled to present before the land use committee on March 18th, um, but obviously uh, because of, uh, of COVID, that meeting did not happen and we are very appreciative to the community board for hosting us this evening. Um, I, I will note that this project has been presented to the Parks Community Advisory Committee on multiple occasions, its design committee and its full committee, um, uh, of which it was uh, um, uh, very well received and, and Rob Paris actually joined us for that last meeting. Um, the Plaza project, um, and Lindsay uh, is gonna run through the, uh, sort of drive the slides as I speak for the beginning and then I'm actually gonna turn it over to her uh, for the specific design elements. Um, but the Plaza project, was actually the first section of Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, to be constructed. You can see it sitting there uh, in red. It takes up about, it's about two acres. Um, and uh, it has lots of, um, of purposes. Um, not only does it connect the Dumbo section of the park through the Southern Piers, but is to serve as um, a, a public plaza and more open space of the park. Uh, and it was supposed to be the first part of the park to be developed. Um, in fact, in 2008, we, um, after going through community board and LPC review, we removed the purchase building to not only build out this section of the park, but to really open up the view plane um, to uh, both bridges and to the Manhattan skyline. Um, and right after we took down the purchase building in 2008, we were ready to go with construction as the first part of the park to be built, um, at which point uh, New York City DOT received significant resources through the federal economic stimulus package to do repair work on the bridge itself. They asked us if we would halt the construction of this two acres, as there was lots of park still to build, um, and could we stand out on this part, come back to it later after they uh, did the repair work on the bridge. Um, I'm proud to say that that work has been completed and what was to be the first section of Brooklyn Bridge Park built out is actually now going to be the final section of Brooklyn Bridge Park. With the completion of the Pier 2 uplands um, later this summer, um, the only remaining piece of the original park plan is this two acres directly under the park. Go ahead, Lizzie. Um, so this is what it looks like today. It's uh, a big, large, open sort of uh, a slab of, of property. Um, we do currently use the site, it's fenced off, uh, but we do use it for um, the occasional programming. For example, Photoville, which is a signature program that has been taking place in the park for the last 10 years, um, is here uh, for about two weeks uh, in late August, early September. Um, we've done a couple other activations in this space, um, but it largely sits, as you see it in this image, um, as unused uh, space directly underneath the bridge. Another uh, uh, sight line of it, uh, looking directly at um, St. Anne's Warehouse, um, uh, and you can see the Manhattan Bridge in the backdrop. Um, as I said, DOT had some work that they needed to do on the bridge itself. Part of their work also included um, directly around the bridge abutments where they did um, store cobblestones and uh, security bollards, as well as that wrought iron fence. The, when our project is complete, public will be able to walk um, on those cobblestones past the bollard line, but uh, all the way around the bridge abutment, um, including on the water side, uh, the public will never be allowed to go into the wrought iron fence. That's DOT controlled property that is uh, fenced off for uh, security reasons. 
Um, but this photo, uh, which was in 2018, shows the portion of this project that was DOT's uh, work, which has been completed. The last design that we showed this group was this design in 2016, um, which showed um, uh, the Empire Fulton Ferry Lawn, uh, expanded a little bit, an additional lawn uh, closer up to the water's edge, um, and planting berms that would help us um, both from an aesthetic perspective as well as some significant design constraints that the space has. And specifically, those design constraints are that uh, we need to ensure that New York City DOT has the ability uh, for vehicular access to the bridge itself and to the abutment and to be able to drive in uh, to the site via New Dock Street um, and enter the, the plaza itself. Um, but there also needs to be protection along Water Street to provide security for the bridge abutment so that no vehicle driving down Water Street could make a right turn off of Water Street, pick up significant speed, and head straight towards the bridge abutment. That's a, a U.S. Homeland Security requirement. And so originally in the 2016 design, those large berms, those, those planting area berms, um, were designed to prevent vehicles from driving in, but to also ensure that uh, DOT could get around them. Um, and after we had this design in 2016, working closely with the CAC, the community board, uh, we engaged Pratt uh, in 2018 for a community engagement uh, and vision planning session uh, that actually lasted the better part of nine months or so. Um, lots of stakeholder organizations participated, lots of individual interviews and breakout sessions. Um, and the result of that community planning process um, gave us a bunch of significant feedback. Um, the, the community felt fairly strongly through this process that there should be some passive use of the space some landscape and it should be a public plaza, which obviously has always been our intention. Um, that there should be um, intimate and restive spaces throughout it, places to sit um, as well as places for just sort of quiet pass through. Um, there was a recommendation that we should continue to use the historic Belgian block throughout the plaza, though I will note that um, historic Belgian block is not ADA compliant and therefore we actually in the park uh, controlled property. We don't use historic Belgian block because it's not ADA compliant and, and we uh, we obviously sort of do things that are. Um, uh, there was a request for connectivity to the rest of the park, obviously connecting the downhill section through the southern piers. Not listed here, um, but um, uh, no, I'm sorry, it is listed here, excuse me. Uh, it was requested that there was a significant honoring of the bridge to really identify to people that they were under the Brooklyn Bridge and that the, uh, the history and the historic nature of that, um, and that we should honor Emily Roebling. And um, though not a design element of this, we have been having conversations not only with the Parks Community Advisory Committee, but also with the folks at City Hall about naming the space for Emily Roebling. That, Roebling, that is something that we um, are very supportive of, and, and we feel like it is um, not only the right thing to do, um, but will actually significantly um, uh, have significant meaning, not just to the park, but to the community at large. Um, what's not included in this and has been long talked about for years is that in the winter time, we have long talked about this space being used as a seasonal ice skating rink, temporary ins installation. Um, and uh, not a brick and mortar rink like they have in Prospect Park, for example, but more of a, of a seasonal installation that comes in every year and then leaves uh, like the way Bryan Park does it. And we still feel very strongly that that um, is good use for this space. However, being that this space has not yet been built out and we have not yet operated the park with this space completed, we felt before we went down the road of any new significant programming, either in the winter or in the summer, we should build out the space, see how it operates first, um, and then pick up that question again, both in terms of ice skating, which again, we think is right, um, as well as any additional summer programming, we want to see how the space operates first before we do that. Um, and therefore, this design um, is typically silent on it, uh, though it does uh, still allow for, the way it's been designed would allow for the spacing. Um, Lindsay, if you want to go to the next slide. 
Uh, and so this is the design itself, the new design that has been significantly updated based on the feedback that we've gotten through that planning process, both again with facilitated by Pratt, but with the CAC and the community board representatives. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay and she's gonna walk you through the specific details. Thank you. Um, so as Eric mentioned, this is our updated 2020 design and we've incorporated a lot of that good feedback we heard from the Pratt community planning process. Um, we've created more opportunities for intimate and restive moments. Uh, there's more seating along the water. Uh, the smaller lawn that faces the bridge uh, is surrounded with new planting, framing the views and the of the bridge and the Manhattan skyline. Um, and we've created some more robust planting along Water Street while still uh, meeting those DOT requirements to, to have um, uh, protection along Water Street um, of the, the abutment. Uh, the new Design um, opens up more desire lines for pedestrians to walk through the space, this new path uh, that cuts through the lawn. Um, and there's more porosity here uh, at the Water Street curb line for people to move more freely through the space. I think everyone knows how congested uh, this area of Dumbo can get uh, and what a pinch point it is on Water Street at the sidewalk now that the plaza is completely closed. Um, so we're really envisioning this space as a release valve for, for some of that congestion that, that we've all experienced down in Dumbo. Um, and finally, we've worked really closely with um, our architects, Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, um, in response to, to the request for more Belgian block cobble. Um, so as Eric mentioned, it is not ADA accessible. So we've worked um, with MBVA to identify a new paver um, that is special and, and unique but um, will be fully ADA accessible and allow people, everyone to, to experience the entire space and, and walk along the water's edge here. Uh, and the paper that we selected is really inspired by the bridge itself. This is an overhead shot of the underside of the bridge that shows kind of the intricate cabling um, that supports the deck of the bridge. Uh, so our intent is to use this new concrete paver to mirror that image um, on the ground as you walk through the space. Uh, and here are some design uh, precedents and inspiration. Uh, so our intent is to, so some really striking and dramatic uh, geometric paving um, that will be um, uh, the ground covering as you as you walk through the plaza, uh, and the effect will be very striking. Um, uh, we're the we'll be able to kind of replicate this, the engineering um, of the bridge with the three pigments of uh, concrete pavers that uh, create kind of a weaved pattern um, on the ground here. And this is a rough rendering that gives you a feeling as you walk off Water Street and into the plaza. And, and again, you're really confronted with the bridge itself and its, its engineering um, through this unique paving pattern. These next couple slides just go through some design details. Um, so these are typical park standards. These are uh, wooden benches that will be used as well as salvage granite along the water's edge for seating. Um, and it's important to note that we were able, we were, um, able to salvage some of the granite that came off the bridge abutment during um, the 2018 repairs that Eric mentioned at the beginning of the presentation and they'll be used um, throughout the space for seating. Uh, the purchase building, uh, the old procurement office that once occupied the plaza space that was demoed in 2008, had an old lintel that said uh, purchase building New York City. And we've actually salvaged that and held on to it over the years. And we're going to reinstate it here on Water Street like it once was. Uh, lighting for the plaza, again, we're going to be using uh, park standards. We're, we're pulling some of our larger light poles um, we're uh, pulling these kind of taller light poles in order to minimize the amount of light poles required and maintain as much open space as possible. Uh, and the strategy here is really to, to anchor those lights along the, the planting uh, so we're not congesting the open space. Uh, and then finally, uh, we are installing vehicular rated bollards as part of this project. And this is really in response to the 2017 attack at Hudson River Park uh, at their greenway there. Uh, and it's part of a larger citywide initiative to protect public spaces. And this is Brooklyn Bridge Park's response to, to that initiative. Um, so we intend to run vehicular rated bollards from St. Anne's Warehouse all the way along the curve line uh, to the Pier 1 entrance at Old Fulton and Furman Street here. Uh, and these bollards aesthetically are going to mirror what DOT already installed along uh, the bridge abutment. So uh, there will be continuity there. 
Uh, and these last two images are just renderings of the site. So this is again uh, on Water Street looking out onto the water, uh, the smokestack building. And this rendering really gives you kind of a feeling of how robust that planting will be um, along Water Street. And this last slide is a bird's eye view. Um, this was rendered from an image taken at the top of eight old Fulton looking down. And I'll hand it back over to Eric to, to talk through timeline of, of the construction. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so the the timeline is that we are uh, on, currently on schedule to have this project completed um, by the end of December 2021. Um, and so we are uh, hoping to go to LPC uh, next month. Uh, they've got a meeting scheduled for May 19th. We're hoping to be on that agenda. If not that agenda, then uh, two weeks later, they have a meeting in uh, in early June, uh, who's, and we'd, we would be on that agenda, if not the mid-May agenda. Um, after LPC, uh, you know, we continue to work with our partners in government. There's some interagency stuff that we are still uh, doing in tandem. Um, but the plan would be th uh, this summer to really go through the procurement process and to get a contractor on board with the goal of breaking ground on the project in the late coming fall. So. Uh, late fall of 2020, and it's about a year-long project, um, and that's how we would hit the completion date uh, that's targeted for December of 21. Um, so it's an, an aggressive schedule, but um, the construction itself should only take a year or so, um, and uh, we're certainly ready to go with all of the required funding. That's, uh, I think that's it, but we're happy to take any, any questions that you have, and, and again, thank you for the opportunity to present before the executive committee. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Carlton or Irene, do you have any questions? Carlton, uh, you need to come off mute. Mr. Singletary, I wanted to let you know that um, Ms. Danner is um, on the call by phone, uh, but okay. did not um, unmute at her end. And all the people that have called in, um, they are merely uh, Call in user number one through caller and user number 12. I can't tell which one is Irene. So, um, okay, no problem. Okay. I just see Carlton came off, well, Carlton went back on mute. I'm waiting for him to come off mute again. Okay, great. Carlton, any me? comments? Yes, okay. I can now. You can hear me now. Okay. Oh, I see. If I hit this, all right. There you go. Um, Right, just I heard from Karen Johnson, who lives uh, in the area. She's a part of the Dumbo committee, or no, well, Dumbo group, and she's also the secretary of the Landmarks Land Use Committee, which is our committee. I chatted with her, and she felt very positive about it. Uh, I did see on the email that Doreen Gallo from the Dumbo group uh, did send something to uh, Rob about the, you know, what they felt about the, the construction. Personally, I feel very favorable uh, about it. And if you're ready, I will then make a motion to approve. Thank you. Okay, Carlton, hold, hold that thought. Um, let me just go back to the district manager um, because we are gonna take a roll call vote. So Rob, are you ready? Um, well, uh, two things, Mr. Singletary. Um, as Carlton mentioned, I did receive an email from uh, Doreen Gallo. Um, based on the letterhead, it seems like she's speaking on behalf of the Design and Concessions Committee or the Community Advisory Council. Um, uh, as, as Mr. Landau mentioned, I was at the last presentation by Van Valkenburg Associates, and um, the, the presentation was very well received with a lot of gratitude for how much work the landscape architect did to address earlier concerns. So I'm not quite sure what to do with a nine point letter that I received at 539. Um, when the last time I was with the same group of people, everything seemed to be well received. Um, if okay, so we'll I take, this. To do we'll something, take that. We'll okay. take that letter offline. All right. I don't know that that has an immediate bearing on the vote, but we we definitely will take that offline because 
uh, it might be difficult to share with everyone, but thank you for, for pointing that out. And thank you, Carlton, for pointing that out as okay. well. But, but before and if, we go if into- Mr. Gordon is, is fully here um, audibly, um, yes. we don't need to do a roll call vote. The voice will, will suffice. Are we going to have any questions before we have a motion? We, so hold on, Barbara. That's what we're trying to get to now. Just hold on. Um, actually, Rob, I, I would prefer to do the, the roll call vote because it's easier to track who's voting, given that we're going through technology. Happy to. Yeah, because it's hard to track by, by voice who's who, and then some people are on mute, some people are off mute. So it just makes life easier for me. I let, agree. Me let me again repeat that the entire meeting is being recorded. Not that anybody has said anything that hopefully they wouldn't say again, but just wanted to periodically remind everyone that the entire meeting is being recorded. I don't want anyone to lose sight of that. Um, so with, with that, um, I'll entertain a motion to accept the presentation um, that was given this, this just now by Eric Landau and the organizations representing the changes to the Fulton Ferry Historic District. I move to approve the uh, application. Great, thank you, Carlton. Can I get a second? I second, Mr. Singletary. Thank oh, you, Mr. Jordan. That's a second. Appreciate that. Is there any discussion on the motion? I, Mr. Singletary, I just had a couple of questions. Sure, uh, Mr. Jordan. I just, sure. just wanted to find out uh, because of the hiatus uh, or the you know in the construction, the December twenty first uh, date was that is that realistic or could it go after that? And the second question was, uh, and they might have missed it, missed it uh, were there any public restrooms in the area or planned for the area? Uh, thank you. If you don't, if you don't mind, I'll take the second part first. Um, there are public bathrooms um, in uh, Empire Stores, um, which is is very close by. Um, right. And then the next closest public bathroom going in the other direction um, is there's a public bathroom in Pier House Building at Pier One. Um, mm -hmm. Every summer, except for this current summer that we're about to hit, um, uh, we've had um, nicer. Uh, Porta trailers uh, in the Pier One turnaround immediately adjacent to the hotel. So that would be in between the uh, the Pier One uh, bathroom at Pier House uh, and the Empire Stores. Uh, this summer we have not yet activated that because it's not yet clear what the summer will will hold for the park uh, under the current uh, current pandemic. Um, but bathrooms at sort of the Pier One turnaround are something that we certainly talk about long term. Uh, but right now the two year round closest bathrooms are Empire Stores and at Pier House. Um, your your first question about construction and the schedule, um, you know, look, I would say a couple of things. Um, number one, the the ex, uh, expectation is that we would break ground in the late fall, uh, this coming fall. That's several, several months away. And obviously, we are hoping that there is uh, some return to normalcy by then. Um, uh, but additionally, um, you know, construction in the park is actually continuing on current projects, um, including the uplands of Pier 2. We're actually uh, in the final days of finishing out the new Squib Bridge. That preventative maintenance work is continuing, and all of this is under the um, uh, express direction of both the mayor's office and the governor's office. That um, you know, the gov uh, Empire State Development under the governor's office, which uh, is overseeing all those executive orders that have halted construction. I've indicated that parks are essential and that ongoing construction within parks can continue under that, that guidance. So at this time, based on both the fact that construction is expected he kind of feels as essential, we feel we feel fairly confident. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can, can I ask a question now? Go ahead, Barbara. Is, was, was I the only one who just got frozen a minute ago, or did everybody get frozen? It, it happens from time to time. What's the question? We can hear you now. Yeah, the question is, um, until recently, I was spending an awful lot of time in Brooklyn Bridge Park and discovered places I hadn't been to before, and everything in the park couldn't have been done better. It's just exquisite. Barbara, I hate and, to interrupt, but I need you to get closer to the microphone. Oh, oh sorry. There you go. Um, Thank you. So I and and clearly this presentation tonight reflects a continued, very high standard 
of excellence in this proposal, and I think it's beautiful. You did raise the issue that I was concerned about, and that is the possibility of ice skating. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been hoping to see um, under the bridge. My concern is by waiting. Um, I would like to know that you have looked into what would be required to put an ice skating rink here so that you don't, once you put all the money and effort in here, say, oh, to put in an ice skating rink, we'd have to rip up this beautiful new ground. So that's my only concern. And and thank you for that. It's uh, First of all, thank you for your comments about not only the design, but your current experience in the park, uh, but for your question. Um, and so the short answer is yes, we absolutely have. We've been, you know, for several years as we've been going through this, this design, ice skating has been a significant component to it for the winter activity, because what Brooklyn Bridge Park is really missing in many respects is winter recreation and activation. And, and an ice skating rink is certainly a way to do that. Um, as I said, it was never our intention to build a brick and mortar rink, but rather to engage with an ice skating rink operator who would bring in and set up an installation like what they do in Bryant Park and then take it away at the end of the season. Um, in order to do that, we've done a lot of analysis, meeting with ice rink operators around the city and touring ice rinks around the city, including in Bryant Park, to determine what size space you need available to have different sizes of rinks, what backup house space you need to have available, both for um, gate change locations and ice melt machines and ice chillers. Um, and what, what part of this design includes that you can't see is that um, in order to do an ice skating rink, there's a significant amount of electrical power that is required. Otherwise, you'd have to have large external generators. We don't want large external generators. So this project actually includes the necessary electrical capabilities underground that would allow us to operate a seasonal ice skating rink installation. So the short answer to your question is absolutely. We have All right. Thank you. Thank you. I also have questions. Um, this is sure, Julia. Go ahead, Julia. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, on, a, on a programmatic basis, um, the picnic tables by um, Jane's Carousel are usually very crowded in the summertime um, with families usually sort of camping out there to preserve it for birthday parties, informal or actually formal with the Jane's Carousel. Um, given that um, you've added um, seating, there, ha there isn't a lot of seating for, for eating though. Um, hopefully the concessions will come back or there will be new concessions if those don't last. Um, and uh, hopefully the timeout market opens again, but um, it would be nice if there were picnic tables um, uh, for e extra picnic tables in that location. Um, uh, and then, yeah. yeah. Do you want me to answer that one first or do you want to ask the... Um, go ahead. Uh, so what I would say is, yes, the picnic tables that we have certainly are heavily used. Um, there have been new picnic tables that have been added um, outside of West Elm on the on the park side. There are uh, picnic tables that have been added along Timeout Market on Old Dock Street. Um, and one of the things that I think that we would look at after this space is built out and we've operated it a little bit as sort of a programmatic element is, are there additional pieces of furniture, tables and chairs that we could add in this location that could accommodate exactly what you're talking about? But I think before we would immediately commit to that, we would wanna see how the space is utilized, how people pass through it, how congested it becomes and so forth. But certainly as you see throughout other areas of the park where we three, the uplands of Pier 3 or 6, where we added picnic tables in the back corner, and adding furniture is something that we can certainly do relatively. Okay, thank you. Um, and my other comment is a design comment, and I may be the lone voice here. Um, I think you've developed a very respectful design, um, and it's um, an acknowledgement of the history of Dumbo. Um, I think it is conservative. Um, I, I think that there are um, there are much there, there, there's also the artistic um, side of Dumbo that's a little bit uh, less conservative, frankly. And um, I, I hope that we, you would consider the opportunities to incorporate um, art, public art in the future, um, maybe even rethink your lighting program to be a little bit just a little bit more edgy, you know, not as uh, traditional as the rest of the park because it is a plaza and so it is an opportunity to be a little bit more expressive 
than um, other parts of the park. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're adding electrical conduits under the, um, the pavers so that you don't have to rip them up in the future, but you know, maybe even some extra conduits uh, for a potential lighting program in the future that may be a art installation or a permanent installation. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, you know, we we feel very strongly about public art in the park and there being a transition to the different types of art that we have in the park, not just what types of art, but where it goes. You know, last year, obviously, we had uh, Saya Armajani's Bridge Over Tree on the Empire Fulton Ferry lawn immediately adjacent to this area. Uh, just uh, this past winter, we had Anthony Gormley's New York City Clearing. Um, uh, and obviously, we've had lots of art in the past. So certainly, this could be a location that could continue that trend. Um, but we take sort of art as a case-by-case -case basis of what we put and where we put it based on a variety of factors. Um, uh, but continuing our public art program is certainly something that we feel very strongly about doing. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Singletary, it, Bill Floyd, I have a question also. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, I have a concern. I, I love the design, everything, uh, the planning, everything that got, has gone into it. Uh, my concern is the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Occasionally, they do do refurbishment of the bridge, and sometimes debris may be falling from the bridge onto the plaza. Uh, what have you uh, done to address this or uh, this concern? Just curious. Thank you. Um, so we actually have an MOU with New York City DOT that anytime they need to come into the space and access it for any type of construction work, they actually have to coordinate it with us, um, and so that we. Um, could make whatever arrangements we needed to make to protect the space below. Um, the most recent example of this is actually not with DOT, but with MTA, um, in that um, prior to us putting up the scaffolding over the section of the park underneath the Manhattan Bridge, that when the MTA would come in and do work over, uh, do work on the Manhattan Bridge over that section of parkland, they would notify us in advance, and we would actually, working with them, close that section of parkland for the period of time that they were doing work, because they told us that debris falling was a possibility while they were doing work. So again, we have an MOU with New York City DOT that if they need to come in and do something, they need to coordinate it with us so we can appropriate action. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional board um, members from board, any additional questions from board members? All right, hearing none. Um, Rob, are you ready to do the roll call vote? I am ready. And we will start with you, Mr. Singletary. Yes. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Allegringer. Yes. Yes. Ms. Thurston. Yes. Ms. Cohen Chung. Yes. Mr. Gordon. Yes. Mr. Flanoy. Yes. And Mr. Brandon Smith. Yes. Uh, the motion carries unanimously 800. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your support. And Mr. Landau, have a great evening. Thank you to you and your colleague for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope everyone uh, stays safe during this challenging time. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Carlton, you have one other item. Right. You can read uh, it from the agenda. I'll summarize it. I don't have an agenda in front of me, but it's 412. So, so hold on, hold on. In fairness to everyone, let me read it so you okay. don't have to summarize this. Hold on. So right. the second item under Landmarks and Preservation uh, Certificate of Appropriateness Application is 412 Clinton Avenue, Clinton Hill Historic District. Application is to replace all windows and, and all facades with new aluminum clad historic profile windows that replicate original period mutants. Install new slate, roof tiles, and construct a new full width three-story rear yard extension. Back to you, Carlton. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I guess you'll begin your presentation. I guess the areas that I'm most concerned about is the um, extension in the backyard and if you, one of the things you can bring up in your presentation is uh, how far will it go into what we call the donut? And also, have you notified the neighbors on either side as to the work you're going to be doing in the back in the backyard 
extension. So Rob, do we have a representative for this application? Oh, we do, Mr. Singletary. Uh, Todd Filippi, who is the architect, is online, as is Paul Burke, uh, Pastor Paul Burke, who is the executive director of Team Challenge, which has owned this building for many years and is now expanding. Okay, great. Uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours. I'll let you decide who's going to speak first. Well, first of all, uh, my name is uh, Pastor Paul Burke, I'm the Executive Director of Brooklyn Teen Challenge. I just want to thank you, uh, Executive Committee, for meeting uh, with us, especially uh, during uh, the trying times that we're in right now. Uh, so I do appreciate your time and your effort to make this happen. Uh, for the project for 412 Clinton Avenue, just a little bit of history. Um, Teen Challenge has been located at 412 Clinton Avenue now since 1958. Uh, we are a residential uh, program that helps uh, young men and adults uh, that struggle with addiction and life controlling issues. Um, we've been in much need of a renovation uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, it started in, in 1958 uh, by David Wilkes, and we have not had a major renovation since then. Um, we are uh, looking to uh, improve the house, uh, but all in accordance to landmark and uh, the aesthetics of the, of the, of the community that, that the building is in. Um, we we did own some property up the street 444 uh vanderbilt which was recently sold we sold that property to be able to do a renovation on this house because 412 clinton is not only in a historic district but the building has quite a bit of history too uh because this is the uh, landmark program the flagship program which is now uh, been established in over 120 countries around the world. Uh, we have uh, over 240 centers just in the United States. And this is the house, this is the building where the program started at. Uh, we have a, approximately a 75 to 86 percent success rate in helping uh, men, women, teenagers, and adults uh, uh, find recovery from drugs and alcohol. I myself actually am, am a product of, of the program itself, and now I'm uh, the executive director. Um, like I touched back on a few minutes ago, we had sold a building up the street to be able to be able to fund uh, this expansion. Uh, and um, one of the reasons why we're doing the expansion, uh, and, and do we have to make the building a little bit larger, is because. Uh, we lost some square footage by selling the property up the street. But in order to keep this building up and, and to make sure it works well, going to fit into and um, was going to uh, look attractive, uh, we had to do a major renovation. But in selling those buildings, we had to make up some square space, uh, which, which we are doing. Uh, I have Todd Philippi with me. Um, he is going to go through some uh, slides and, and show you uh, that the renovation itself, the expansion itself in the back uh, is, is not really able to be seen, not at all from the front and not really from the rear unless you're actually on the property. Uh, and, and, and the drawings were, were drawn up with all of that in mind so that it would not be an eyesore in the community. Um, one of the things, to be noted uh, with um, with what's going on in our community right now is um, we've been able to give away 128,000 pounds of food from this from this program uh, during this uh, trying time for our city, especially uh, we've been a light uh, in this community, and we want to continue to be able to do that for many many more years. Uh, but the only way. Uh, that we would be able to do it on this property or, or, or in this community is, uh, is by doing a renovation and, of course, uh, a, a small expansion. Uh, Todd, if you can in, uh, move up a little bit. The next slide. <laughs> Todd, can you show where, the, um, where you can see it from the front, the view from the front? 
So that's the front of the building. Uh, that's not going to change. It's just going to be all updated uh, with the same uh, style uh, uh, windows and, and construction. If you could just look at the back real quick, because I just want to answer the, the uh, respond to that question uh, that the gentleman, gentleman had earlier. Now, this is from the back, from the rear. Um, if you look straight from Vanderbilt's side, you will not be able to see the expansion from the street. Now, if you go into the alleyway, uh, which would be on our property, of course, then you'd be able to see the back uh, of the building. Um, so we really feel confident that, that it's not going to be uh, uh, an eyesore uh, from either, e either view. Uh, but so, Tom, I was just going to say, so your back is really looks like it, you know, it doesn't affect any of your neighbors directly. It's not going to, construction's not going to interfere with your neighbors and your neighboring buildings. Yeah, uh, that's, that's right. Yep. Yeah. This is Todd Phillippe, the architect, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the details of the proposal once Paul wraps up. Mm -hmm. So uh, the building was, was drawn up with all of those things in mind. And like I said, we've been in this community since 1958. Uh, we're a historic, uh, an historic building. We have people come from all over the, the actual world to visit this spot um, uh, because, like I said, there's, there's over 1,400 centers around the world in 120 countries uh, where, where this program is helping people that are struggling with addiction. Uh, and it started right here on this house. So uh, that's why uh, it's very important to us that we update it and we, we, we make it something that we can be proud of in this community uh, uh, and something that could be updated. And for people that come in for recovery, we want them to come to a nice place. We want them to feel uh, like they're getting an upgrade in life, if you know what I mean. Uh, something that they could feel nice and feel comfortable and, 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 and be able, to, uh, be able to, to have the things that we need to facilitate the program, commercial kitchen, uh, you know, uh, room for, for recreation and, and, and TV, and also for, for classrooms and meeting rooms and counseling rooms and, and, and of course, sleeping quarters. So we believe that uh, the expansion is very modest. Um, it's, it's basically the least of, that we could have done to be able to continue to run uh, the program the way that we feel uh, that we need to. Uh, Todd, if you could, you wanna take over? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So if, if you notice from this um, tax photo, the property is right at the, it's right at the edge of the Clinton Hill Historic District. The building that is to the left there is not in the historic district. That's the line right where this property stops. And you can see the style of windows that they had was nine over one um, throughout the building where there were nine muttons in the top window and there of the double hung windows and no muttons in the bottom. So our, our plan is to replace the windows with historically appropriate mutton windows that would have the nine over uh, zero pattern. So we would be restoring the front of the building and then giving you uh, an aerial view of the existing site plan. We're looking down right now, there is a little over 82 feet between the back of the existing manor house building and the carriage house garage. The proposed addition would extend that by about 20 feet. Now I'm gonna take you where we're standing in back of the property and we are looking to the south at the six story apartment building that is next to it. And you see the big blank brick wall in the upper left photo. Yes. And where that basketball court, uh, the basketball hoop is, is about as far out as the addition that we're proposing would come from the existing back of building. So to the south where it's not the historic district is the six story apartment building. And then in the next frame, we're looking at the little lightway that is between the 
two buildings, the one on the right fronting on Vanderbilt. And then you start to see the carriage house garage on the right side there. And there's a big oak tree that mm. we're planning to preserve right at the entrance to the driveway. Slide th uh, picture three in the bottom left corner is standing at the back of the house and looking to the carriage house. And then along the right is a, a solid fence for the property that fronts on Vanderbilt. And then looking over to the right, there's a open community space for the house that is to the north. And that's um, multiple apartments that are in that house as well. So that's their, their shared outdoor space. So this is the existing back of the house that is with brick, uh, fire escape, uh, window air conditioning units, windows in need of replacement. And what you'll see in our proposal is that we, are, we would be recreating that facade with the proposal without the fire escape, without the air conditioners in the window. Uh, we would be really replicating and upgrading the existing construction with that proposed extension again, which comes out to about where that basketball hoop is. This is the property immediately to the north, and it has a one-story rear addition to it that um, extends out about the length that we would be pushing out the addition from the existing back of house. And again, that's uh, multiple apartments in that house. And that's just some shared outdoor space there uh, for the residents. So if we look on the top at the existing site plan, you can see where the building comes out to now. There's an exterior stair to the basement. And then there is a, an entranceway with a little portico over it. And then in the slide immediately below, you see the shaded area. And that would be our 20 foot extension behind the house. And we would be wrapping that around the corner and providing handicapped ramps so that we can, we want to make the building totally accessible. Right now, it is not accessible. Anybody in a wheelchair with ambulatory problems really can't be part of the program in the house. By the time we're done, it would be 100% accessible, including an elevator that would connect the basement, first, second, and third floors of the building. And I understand you're also doing some roof work and putting in new tiling in that area? Yes, that's right. What, what we're proposing is a, um, a composite material that looks like slate, looks like the original slate, uh, it has a lifetime warranty, and it is a lot lighter than slate, and it's easier to make the roof watertight. And so we're proposing to both re-roof the existing where we have damaged slate and to extend that same material onto the addition that would be constructed in the back of the building. So I'll take you through the floor plans now of the existing, which is on the left side, and the proposed on the right side. On the left side, we have the current cellar plan, which has a lounge, a small exercise room. All the showers are down there. The laundry is down there. Um, on the first floor, which is the bottom left, existing right now is an office area a memorial library area, their meeting, dining, kitchen. Um, everything is, is very tight and compact in there. The proposed plans to the right, we have the elevator that would be going added on the bottom side that would be going down to the cellar level, and there would be a, a large pantry down there. The recreation room, which the current lounge would be expanded, we'd have a larger exercise room, and then we would move some office space down there as well. 
We would also be providing a new uh, interconnected stair that's in the bottom left corner here that would be a, a fire escape stair that goes to all the levels of the building and adding an additional uh, fire escape stair from the bottom level as well. On the main level, we would have an open dining chapel area, and that's both where the residents would eat and would come together for meetings. And then we would have a commercial kitchen. And on the very bottom, you can see where the ramp is that would be coming up from the back to provide handicapped access to the building. And we've also shown the ramp extending out to the front of the building. It's not necessary in order to have access. And we received a little bit of pushback on that from landmarks. They said they're typically not in favor of um, changing the appearance of the front of buildings with a handicapped ramp. Even though our proposal was to use um, wrought iron for the railing that would look similar to the existing wrought iron on the front portico. So that's something that we're, we're, we don't have to have in order to have access, and we would certainly be interested in what your opinion is regarding that ramp to the front. Well, it would, yeah, I, I, we always favor handy, you know, uh, access for the disabled, uh, but you will have to work that out with landmarks. It's a very difficult uh, point. I, okay. I do like the work. Uh, essentially, it looks like it's, you're keeping the, you know, there is a lot of work that's being done, but you're keeping the essence of the building going. And this is something that I think that my, I would say my committee would, would most likely approve. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good. So on the, the second and third floors, what we, we've basically done is we've um, just improved and upgraded the sleeping and bathing facilities we're providing on each level showers, bathrooms that are accessible, handicapped accessible, uh, along with a laundry room for each level so that the, the residents don't have to go down to the basement to take a shower or to do their laundry. It can all be on the level where their living sleeping quarters are. And then the, and so on the left is the existing and on the right is the proposed for the second and third floor. Now, the other thing that you'll see up here is we're proposing on the third floor a roof deck. That roof deck would be on top of the bathrooms and the commercial kitchen that would be added on the side of the building. The reason that we, we have kept that as a roof deck is in order to preserve the architectural profile of the back of the building, which you'll see in just a moment. Um, these are sections that are cut through the building. The top one is going from Clinton Avenue on the right and then backwards to the addition on the left side. And you can see the shaded areas of floor and the dashed line shows what's proposed to be extended from the existing building. And that section that's marked AA is the bottom left that goes through the building. And you can see here the roof terrace that's at the level of the third floor. And then if we look at the other section BB, that's where the elevator is that provides access to all four levels of the building. And a lobby space behind it that enables it to be accessible for the entranceway. Now we have, have literally, I'm gonna pop up to the floor plans above just for a moment. We have literally designed this to, this to the inch for it to be accessible. The bathrooms that we have fit in, room behind that elevator for a five foot turning radius for a wheelchair at the entrance way. So we really have designed the expansion on the side down to the inch that's needed to accommodate um, the accessibility requirements. Now looking at the 
an overhead axonometric view showing the existing property on the left side. And you can see the house that is to the north. It's part of the historic district. And you can see their uh, one story addition with the deck that pops out the back there. And then on the right side, you can see our proposed expansion of the existing building that would come out from that red dashed line. And you begin to see how we melded that roof deck into the architectural style of the existing building. Uh, the little fence that we show down here is where we're proposing to have a trash enclosure so that that will be out of sight um, for the residents next door. We would also be putting a solid fence along the property line, extending it down from the existing one at Vanderbilt so that the parking is screened from the adjacent outdoor space for the, um, the apartments to the north. If you look at the back elevation, the top view is how it exists right now. And the bottom view includes our proposal where there would be no back port, uh, portico entrance or fire escape. And then you can see on the right side there the proposed roof deck and wrought iron railings that would extend within the brickwork. And in the bottom, you can see, bottom right, you can see the handicap ramp that would be leading up to the entrance from the parking lot. So uh, projected views from the model of the existing house. This is what it looks like from the front on Clinton Avenue. On the bottom, we have the same building with the addition in the back, which will be virtually unseen. Um, I've outlined on the right side our proposed materials to restore the front. And the only thing that really would be different would be that the windows would be Them finish up that will help us move. I, was to see, wait, wait, able to, I would just say right yeah. now, I would move to approve. Yes, I'm not looking for that. Hold on, let me right. let them finish and I'll come back oh. to you for the normal protocol. So, Todd, it's back to you and let's let's get through the next three, two pages quickly, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Singletary. So, these are our views from the front on the top, the <laughs> south, and then the bottom is with the addition that is proposed which really can't be seen. Um, and then on the right side, if you took out all the trees and the vegetated growth that's already between the two properties, and you could look up, then this is what you'd see, but only the back 20 feet of that is an addition. Most of that is just part of the existing building. 
Then from the back of the property, again, these are the two views that were shown previously from Vanderbilt Avenue. And if you look up the gate, the, um, the mechanical gate there, and you can see the existing building on the top right slide, and then the bottom right shows it with the uh, back coming 20 feet out and with the rooftop deck being added. This is a, uh, a 3D overhead view, if there were no properties around it, of, of what the expansion would look like when the construction would be complete. And you can see we're looking at replicating the existing <laughs> back of the building uh, for most part. And then we have the, the roof deck, which again, we kept that lower in order to preserve the original outline of the rear architecture and yet at the same time meet the needs of the uh, Teen Challenge program that goes on. And you can see the handicap ramp coming up to the side entranceway. And again, we showed it going around to the front, but that's something that we, we do not have to have in order to provide accessibility. And when it's all said and done, if there's enough money left over, uh, we want to also restore that carriage house to its original condition as well on the exterior. And with that, I'm finished the presentation. Thank you for the presentation and to Pastor Paul Burke, thank you just in general for all the work that you're doing and the work that is being done um, through Teen Challenge and, and all the programs that you have for the community. So thank you for being a part. It's a blessing and a pleasure to serve. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, aside from Carlton, actually, we do this differently. Let me entertain a motion to accept um, the presentation as presented. Uh, I so, move, Mr. Singletary. This is Atlanta Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Second. I second it. Thank you, Carlton. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, Rob, I'll turn to you so we can go through a roll call vote. Um, and starting with you, Mr. Singletary, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Ella Gringer? Barbara, are you with us? Ms. Thurston? Yes, yes. Oh, we have a yes from Barbara. Yes. You do. Jessica. Yes. Uh, Juliet Cohen Chung. Yes. Mr. Gordon. Yes. Mr. Flanoy. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Uh, the motion carries unanimously 800. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, best of luck in your future endeavors. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for Thank accommodating you. us this way and stay safe. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Item number seven on the agenda, State Liquor Authority on-premise liquor license. We have one item doing business as, uh, I shouldn't say doing business as, it's Charlie Walk Work LLC doing business as Evil Twin Brewing, 45 Main Street. Um, Mr. Smith, do you want to lead us through this? Actually, Mr. Chairman, uh, the applicant has asked to be laid over. The applicant wish is granted. Thank you. <laughs> 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 um, so now we're up to chairperson's report. So let me let me start with a couple of thank yous. So I want to thank the board office. Um, I thanked you at the beginning. I want to thank you again as part of my report. Um, and in particular, to to the to everyone. I mean, it's not easy to be confined to your respective locations, to not have the the movement that you once had. Uh, I'm sure this must be particularly challenging to our new colleagues. You, know, you figure on March 11th, March 11th, we introduced you, and we were excited that you were part of the team. Um, and I know I haven't seen you since then. I'm seeing you tonight, Tanya, through um, the technology that's here. But to be able to continue to work 
as hard as you have. Um, Rob, I want to thank you in particular, not to single you out versus the team, but I know you've been making the, the conscious effort to go into the office. You've been, you know, leading the team. And so for that, I want to give a special thank you to you as well. Um, and, you know, just the entire team. Carol Ann has always been someone who pays attention to detail, and she's done that remotely and in the office. So thank you all for the work that you've done to keep the office flowing, to keep the work of the community um, at the forefront, and for the great lengths to which you undertook to get us to this meeting tonight. And I'm sure all of us have seen the original invitation, the cancellations. Some of you may have seen multiple emails confirming the meeting or not. So there were some technical challenges, some difficulties, but all of that, we're here tonight conducting the business of the community. So for that, I want to say thank you. Yeah. Um, making history is not easy. People can evaluate history, but as you make history, it's not easy, and we're doing that tonight. Second thing I want to, second group I want to thank is all the members. All the members of community board, both the executive committee and the general body, because you too have consistent been consistent in sending me emails, sending the office emails, making sure that we are aware of things that are happening within the community. And in addition, making sure that those of us, or those of you, I should say, who are chairs of committees are making sure that you're thinking and pushing the envelope for how we can keep committees engaged and update on things that are happening within the district. So I wanna thank you all as well. Um, and then I want to thank all of the members of Community Board 2 who have sent me well wishes. Some of you I've spoken to tonight on the phone. Others um, I haven't had a chance to get back to. But I, I have read all of the emails. I want to thank you all. You know, um, those who are aware that I work in the hospital and appreciate the wishes that were sent to me while I'm not a frontline employee per se. Um, I was going to work seven days a week, and so now I'm working five days a week. I decided to take April off, so to speak. But um, <laughs> I, I can't thank you enough for the well wishes, and it means a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll never forget that. The next thing I want to mention is meetings going forward. I know that several committee chairs have asked and inquired, how do we just kind of touch base or keep the committees <clears throat> aware of what's taking place. So let me let me list a couple of facts. Fact one is the community board, Rob, the entire office, Lenny is chair, Lenny is vice chair, Barbara is second vice chair, um, Jessica as secretary. We do not have a say in the technology. The say in the technology is dictated by the city. And the city said you can only use WebEx under these strict guidelines. So that adds another level of complexity for those who may be using other applications like Zoom or other products that are out there. As some of you may or may not have heard, there are some security concerns with Zoom. So I would presume that this is a factor into why the city has mandated that we use Cisco WebEx meetings under a tight protocol. Um, which we are adhering to. Having said all that, you remember in the last time we met in on March 11th, we entertained a motion. It was approved unanimously that the executive committee will act on behalf of the general body. While I understand that these are unprecedented times, if we were in the months of July and August, where we would be taking a recess, we wouldn't be engaging with committees just to keep them up to speed and keep them up to date. So while I haven't made a final determination yet, because I know even tonight, some members were having challenges getting into the meetings. Some of the individuals who confirmed to get into the meeting have sent me notices saying they couldn't get in, they had challenges. I wanna to get to a point where we can work through these challenges and get to a point where um, there's more ease and consistency with using the technology before I give a definitive answer on yes or no about future meetings. All I would ask is that we be a little patient. Let's work through some of these issues and see how we can get to a point where we adhere to the guidelines of the city 
and continue to um, address the concerns that some of you have raised about being in communication with your respective committees. And then my final comment um, is that on the heels of what I just mentioned, we do have budget items that have to be addressed. They cannot go without being addressed, in which case there may be an invitation for some of you uh, who are members of the Finance and Personnel Committee, because we have to address the personnel and finance issues of Community Board 2. And so with that, we may try this again using this technology for the Finance and Personnel Committee. And if we have better outcome or better luck on the next meeting, that may show us a favorable way of moving into expanding it to other committees. But at this time, I'm going to um, hold on giving a definitive answer for that. So let me pause. I've said a couple of thank yous. I've spoken about meetings going forward, mentioned about finance and personnel. Let me pause and see if there's any questions that any members may have given my comments. Uh, this is Bill. Fantastic. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Question I have is uh, currently, right now, we have individuals on the board whose applications they've been accepted. Bill, you're breaking up. Oh, I was asking about. Board, I was asking about board membership. So board membership. It's still following this, the same process as always has. Um, we need to circle back with some direction from Burl Hall. Um, this is another example of where, you know, the pandemic has restricted the normal form of communication. <clears throat> uh, Rob, has, Rob has kept update with those members as they um, have been accepted and need to be placed, as has our representative from Burl Hall, Nan Blacks here. So while I haven't had a chance to communicate with Rob and Nan on this topic, uh, I will do so and get back to uh, the executive committee on what the next steps are. Are there any other questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'll, come, I'll transition to item number nine, district manager's report, Mr. Paris. Um, Mr. Singletary, I had hoped to uh, be able to say that I had e emailed it out earlier today. Um, however, that didn't come to pass. Um, I too want to thank the staff for um, all of their work, which is made much more difficult when we can't just walk around the office and say so directly to each other's faces. Um, we have also faced um, really unprecedented challenges um, with procurement and with technology and the support uh, from the city um, has been a struggle. I, I, I won't put it more harshly than that, but it's, it's been tough and I, and I uh, am respectful of everything that they are trying to do um, all over the city at the same time. Um, but that said, uh, my my highest priorities are getting the staff uh, fully set up uh, to be able to work. The current situation is probably going to extend for several weeks. And so um, I do not have a written report, but hope to have one out as soon as possible. Rob, can you hear me? This is Carl. Okay, um, since I have you here. Um, at the corner of Flatbush Avenue and DeKalb Avenue, uh, right by the Applebee's, there's a growing homeless population at that corner because mm -hmm. apparently Applebee's has closed and decided not to, even though the rest of the stores on that block along Flatbush are operating. Uh, I was hoping perhaps if you can contact the, uh, I guess, whatever homeless. Uh, I guess mayor's office to let them know and maybe they can go out there and see what help they can provide because every time you walk past there at the Calvin Flatbush there are more and more people at that and more and more stuff at that location. Um, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention and I will notify the city. Okay, thanks. 
Any other questions from board members? Okay, great. Um, item number 10, other business. Do we have any other business? So Jessica, my contact has 807. I am asking um, for a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Listen, thank you, everyone. Please be safe, practice social distancing, and um, I can't thank you enough for all of your support and your professionalism. We are a family. We will get through this. We will see each other in person soon. Thank you and be safe. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Hey, Rob, you can send my sandwich to my house. Hi. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't> be fresh. <laughs> I hate your sandwich. <laughs>